Now we come to what I would say is the bread and butter of the competency process itself, and that is the contested competency hearing. The court has determined to, uh, that there is an initial issue in order to competency evaluation. This is the hearing at which the court finds either that the defendant is competent or the defendant is not competent. There is a different standard than applies uh, in the initial hearing. In the initial hearing, it, the standard is, is there reason to believe competency is at issue? In the contested competency hearing, the standard is preponderance of the evidence. The defendant is presumed competent unless and until there's a showing by a preponderance of evidence that the defendant is not competent. One of the major things that you will see is the court is not bound by the competency evaluation. And as a matter of fact, it is a best practice that the court conduct a separate hearing, make its own findings on the record um, about whether the defendant is or is not competent. One of the things that conducting the full hearing does, of course, is it allows the judge to make that record. More importantly, though, it establishes additional information that might, might be necessary for uh, later hearings in determining competency restoration. But at this point, we're simply determining is the defendant competent or is the defendant not competent? Criminal case number 104523, People versus Robert Barnes. We are convened this morning as the mental health court of the district. The court has previously requested that there be a competency evaluation. The court is now has before it a report. People. Good morning, Your Honor. Michael Finkel, uh, Assistant District Attorney on behalf of the state. Good morning, Your Honor. Russell Firth on behalf of Mr. Barnes. Both counsel ready to proceed? Yes, Your Honor. Yes, Your Honor. Okay. People may proceed. Thank you, Your Honor. I believe that you have before you what has previously been marked as State's Exhibit 1, a forensic competency evaluation dated October 29, 2010. The parties have stipulated that the court may accept it into evidence. The parties have also stipulated to the uh, qualifications as an expert of the author of that report, which would be Dr. Smith. I believe um, this is Dr. Jan Jones who's uh, here today. I beg your honors, pardon well, that, that's quite a I'm, I'm thinking of an earlier hearing. Um, we are presenting the testimony of Dr. Jones. The defense has reserved the right to challenge any and all of the conclusions in there, but um, they are permitting, uh, they have agreed that it may be admissible. So, Your Honor, if it please the court, we would like to call Dr. Jones to the stand. Mr. Kirk, do you agree with the statement of the people? Your Honor, uh, I have reviewed Dr. Jones's evaluation. I have spoken with my client before today's hearing, and at this point, I do have to disagree with the conclusion. I'm not telling Your Honor that the evaluator's opinion wasn't accurate the day she did it. I'm saying today, uh, and I think the court will see, that Mr. Uh, Barnes is not able to proceed, that that his, the competency is fluid, and we are seeing that fluidity today. Okay, I appreciate your clarifying your position. Thank you, Your Honor. For the record, then, the court will receive People's Exhibit 1, and based upon the attached script and vitae, we'll find that the witness deck for Jan Jones is a licensed uh, psychiatrist and will allow her to give opinions uh, within that profession. Dr. Jones, if you'll please come forward. Please raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear or affirm under penalty of perjury that the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Please be seated. For the record, if you'll please state your full name and professional address. Um, it's Jan Jones, and I work for the outpatient team at Western State Hospital. May I inquire, Your Honor? Please. Dr. Jones, uh, you have before you what's been marked as State's Exhibit 1, a forensic competency evaluation dated October 29, 2010. Is that a uh, forensic evaluation that you completed? Yes, it is. Is the subject of that evaluation uh, the person to my left or your right in the uh, red clothing? Yes, sir. Your Honor, may the record reflect she's identified the defendant? The record just so reflect. Thank you. When did you prepare this evaluation? On October 29th. Before you I'm sorry. Before you prepared the evaluation, did you review any um, collateral sources? Yes, I reviewed all the police reports and investigative reports related to this incident. Were there any other collateral sources of information? There was some information, um, pretty minimal, from uh, the crisis center. Okay, 
are, are there additional um, uh, items of information listed on page two, uh, numbered one through six under database? That yes, you I, I, and I also talked to Mr. Barnes' father, Mr. Roger Barnes. Where did that interview take place? Up with his father, through the telephone. Okay, and uh, where did your interview with the defendant, Mr. Barnes, take place? In the county jail. How long was that interview? About 70 minutes. Was that before or after you reviewed the collateral sources of information and spoke with Mr. Barnes' father? After the collateral. Is the collateral information you reviewed the type that is commonly relied upon by experts conducting uh, forensic competency evaluations? Yes, sir. When you, um, you did come up with um, a uh, mental health diagnosis for Mr. Barnes, didn't you? Yes, I did. That was um, psychotic disorder not otherwise specified? Yes, sir. Is it possible for a person suffering from psychotic disorder not otherwise specified nevertheless to be uh, capable of assisting rationally in their defense and also able to understand the proceedings? Yes, sir. As a matter of fact, it's your opinion uh, expressed in this evaluation that Mr. Barnes himself is uh, capable of assisting counsel and capable of understanding the proceedings? That's correct. Did you say anything to Mr. Barnes at the beginning of the 70 minute interview? Yes, um, I told him that this interview is being done um, in response to a court order that the report would be sent to the judge with copies to the district attorney, to the district attorney's office as well as the defense attorney and that nothing he said in the interview is confidential and that anything could be brought out in court. Did it appear to you that he understood what you were telling him? Yes, I asked him specific questions about it and he was able to respond. Was he able to restate the information that you gave him? Yes, sir. Did he indicate whether he was willing to continue with the interview? Yes, he said he was. Is there any significance to the fact that he was able to restate the information and then give you a response about whether he wanted to proceed? It showed me that he was able to attend to what I was saying, he was able to take in that information and then repeat it in a very logical fashion. Did Mr. Barnes tell you what his living situation was? Yes, he told me he lived alone in an apartment. Was there any significance to him living alone in forming your opinion? Not necessarily. I mean, it does show a sense of independence and that he is capable to care for himself. But since incompetency, I'm just looking at whether he has the skills to go to court right now. It wasn't terribly significant. Uh, did he indicate whether he was working? Yes, he was working part-time. Did, uh, did the fact that he could hold a part-time job have any significance um, in your opinion? It all gives you background information that he, he was able to um, have the basic skills, but I'm not necessarily saying any of that would significantly say whether he has the skills to go to court. What about the fact that he was able to respond to your questioning about his living condition and his work condition? Peripherally. Did Mr. Barnes tell you anything about whether he had used marijuana? Um, yes, he did. He said he used it sporadically. Did he, did he state anything about consuming alcohol in his right. lifetime? He had some use, it wasn't extensive. Is there anything about his ability to recall past information that entered into um, forming his opinion? No, I thought he was a very, fairly good historian. Much of what he told me matched up with what his father told me about his history. Um, what about his ability to recall accurately what um, your collateral sources were? I didn't see any major discrepancies between what he told me and what collateral sources told me. Did that have any effect on your opinion about his ability to work with counsel? No, I thought he should have a good ability to work with counsel. Um, he was able to respond to my questions pretty easily, um, provide information. Did he, did he tell you anything about whether he would be willing to take medication for his issues? We didn't get extensively into that, but he was he did not seem to be interested in medication. He very much believes in natural um, remedies and did not want to take any artificial medications. Did he tell you anything about medication being bad for his body? Yes. Did that did his ability to assess whether or not to take medication 
have any impact on your opinion about his ability to work with counsel? No. Did it have any impact on your um, opinion about his thought processes in general or his ability to conduct a thought process? No. What is it that led to your opinion that Mr. Barnes has the capacity to understand the nature of charges against him? Um, I was able to ask Mr. Barnes about what his charges were. He was able to state them correctly. He was able to tell me what he thought the police alleged that he did. He was able to tell me what the consequences of those charges could potentially be. Um, he was able to tell me different defense strategies that he might pursue with his uh, attorney. Um, he was able to talk to me very logical, seemed to be able to weigh the pros and cons of different um, strategies. Is there anything else that went in, uh, and that it, did that include your opinion about his ability to assist counsel? Yes. Just as Mr. Barnes was able to talk to me, I assume he could also talk to his attorney. The fact that we didn't have any difficulties communicating, um, we're able to ask different questions, respond. Um, I thought the same could occur with his attorney. Thank you. I have nothing further. Mr. Kurth. Thank you, Your Honor. <clears throat> Dr. Jones, my name is Russell Kurth. I'm going to ask you a few questions, and if I'm not clear or I don't speak loud enough, please let me know so I can clarify. Okay. okay. So, Dr. Jones, how long ago did you speak with my client? Ten days ago. Okay. That's the first time you had met with him, yes, correct? Yes, sir. At that time, you had scant other information upon which to rely. Is that correct? Correct. Uh, is, it, is it true that the jail psychiatric services had not yet spoken with Mr. Barnes? That is correct. And in terms of information from the community, uh, I think you indicated you had very little information? I talked with, oh, you mean from the, I talked oh. with his father, and then I had a little bit of information from the community mental health center. Yes. And that information indicated <coughs> there had been two non-detention referrals for Mr. Barnes. Is that correct? Yes. Uh, those records indicate that he uh, had been diagnosed with a mental illness in the past? No, it's, no, it did not. Did not? He had not been listed as having ADHD as a juvenile? No. I'll direct you to page three of your evaluation. I stand corrected. I was thinking you were talking about a psychiatric diagnosis as an adult. He did have ADHD as an I'm, adolescent. I'm sorry, I wasn't more clear with my question. Thank you. Um, and his father <clears throat> did not indicate to you information about him having maybe had a mental illness. Is that correct? No, his father said he did not have a mental illness. Um, so based on the information that you had, Based on your interview with him, you did not see uh, signs that this gentleman would not be able to proceed with trial. Correct. I did see some signs of um, hyper-religious religious thoughts, but they did not seem to interfere with his ability to work with you or to understand the court processes. And, Doctor, if <clears throat> knowing what you do about um, uh, hyper-religious thoughts, and the possibility of emerging mental illnesses in young people, is it possible that he might present differently today than he did that day? It is always possible. And might it help if the court asked some questions of Mr. Barnes to show how he is doing today? That would be fine. Uh, Your Honor, I would, uh, I appreciate the doctor's, yeah, it's okay, sir. One second. Your Honor, my client was just consulting with me a, a bit, and uh, I, I want to say that my client has authorized me today uh, to, to tell the court my opinion about whether he's able to proceed and to elucidate for the court my feeling that he's not. Um, he's doing the best he, he can today. Uh, I think that the doctor's opinion, uh, I have no reason to doubt it on the day she saw him, but I think we will all see if we ask my client some questions today that we're seeing a different presentation. You have no further questions of the doctor at this time? I do not, and I appreciate your time, doctor. Okay.
Do people have anything further you'd like to ask the witness? Your Honor, I won't know until I uh, hear what the defendant has to say. I would ask leave to uh, or reserve the right to recall Dr. Jones if I deem it necessary. I, and I, Your Honor, uh, would ask that the doctor stay present for the next five or ten minutes to observe my client's presentation. Perhaps that would um, give her a reason to alter her opinion. Okay, Dr. Hugh, please just have a seat and stay with us for a few minutes. People, further evidence you wish to present? Uh, not until later, although we do agree with counsel's recommendation that the doctor remain present. Okay. Mr. Kurt? Thanks, Your Honor. Hey, Mr. Barnes, I'm going to ask you to talk to the judge right now a little bit about your case. Is that okay with you? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, you heard the doctor testifying earlier. What do you think about that? Good and bad. Yeah? Yeah. What about your crime? What about the thing you're charged with? Do you remember what happened? Yeah, I remember what happened. Okay. Can you tell the court about it? Well, we got a girl who's just giving me signals, giving me false hope, giving me everything I want, but uh, leading me on in the wrong direction. And that's the whole reason why I'm here. I said, I can't deal with this anymore. I'm just tired of everything. You talking to me right now? It doesn't even work. I can't deal with this. Oh, fine. Who are you talking to right now? <clears throat> talking to him. Who's him? <clears throat> My savior, I'm talking, he knows. He knows. Okay. Do you and he uh, regularly carry on conversations? Always. He's always talking. Okay. Um, has he chosen you in particular to talk to, as opposed to some other people? Yeah. Why? I can't explain that. We're always talking, he's giving me, he knows. Um, Are you a Christian rapper? You mentioned that you were previously. What? Um, I'll repeat myself. Are you are you a Christian rapper? Yeah. Okay. Of course. Why? Because I was called. That's my calling. My whole calling in life. What makes you believe, I understand you're religious, what makes you believe that this woman wanted you to communicate with her? This woman was flashing lights. She was whispering. She's giving me signals. She's giving me, like I said, false hope. You know, she's leading me on. This is not right, what she has done to me. Can you tell me the different ways she, she showed you that other than the flashing lights? <laughs> I don't know what. I don't understand. What other things that had, did she do to communicate to you that she wanted you to respond? She was telling me. She was telling me. My Lord was telling me. They were all coming from above. All of these answers. All these things were just telling me. Go. Go with it. Did she? She. You mentioned to me earlier that she had a window replaced and that she had uh, trimmed her tree and that these were ways that she was communicating to you that she wanted you? Yes. It, is your Lord also telling you that uh, she wants you? My Lord is always speaking to me. I want to ask you just a couple more questions and then I'm going to ask your honor to uh, inquire. Um, and thanks for trying to clarify for us. We want, to, we want to try to figure this out and do the right thing by you today, okay? Uh, is the judge in charge of the courtroom? The Lord is in charge of the judge, which is in charge of the courtroom. He's here. Okay. So who's going to make the decision on your case of whether you're innocent or guilty? The Lord. Not the judge, not you, not anybody. The Lord is going to make these decisions. And what's he telling you? Right now? Yeah. What decisions are you going to make for you? Has he been talking to you about that? Yes. He knows I'm not guilty. He knows where I'm supposed to be. He knows that I am, my soul belongs to him. Your Honor, I can continue with questions if you wish, or I will turn it over to Your Honor. I'll ask a few questions. Is there anything further you want me to 
to uh, explore, please let me know. Uh, where are you right now, Mr. Lawrence? Where are you right now? We're in the courtroom. Okay, what's, what's happening here? Why are you in the courtroom now? Uh, for some past issues that I have been dealing with because of a woman who has been leading me on. Okay. And if you, do you feel that you're able to explain this to your counsel so that uh, he understands what you want to have done? Excuse me? Are you, have, are you able to explain? What's, what's the role of, of your counsel here, Mr. Kurtz? What, 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 why is he here? Uh, he's my attorney. He's here to help me out. Okay, and you feel that's what he's doing? I feel he's doing his best. I do. Because okay. God has told me that he is supposed to be here. Okay. And you feel that you're able to explain to him your concerns about why you're in this court today? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, likewise, what is the what is the role of, this, of the of the gentleman seated here to your right? This is evil. He does not approve. He is not there with me. He is on the other side. Okay. And what makes him evil? What, what's what's evil about him being on the other side? He is trying to place me in a role that I do not belong in. He is trying to say that I am guilty of things that I did not do. Counsel, any further you want me to ask? Um, if your honor has any further questions about whether he recognizes the court's authority. That's part of it. You, you do, tell me who I am and what I'm supposed to do. What, who am I? What, what, what am I supposed to do in, the, in this hearing? You're a judge. Okay. And as a judge, what, 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 what do I do? You tell me if I'm guilty or not guilty, if the evil wins or if the Lord wins, which I hope you are on my side. Okay. Um, I noticed, Mr. Barnes, that a couple times when the judge asked you questions that you asked him to repeat. Were you not hearing what he said? He was, yeah, he's talking. Who's talking? Tell the judge, tell the judge why you weren't able to focus. I can't place anybody above my Lord. He, when he talks to me, I am listening. Always. He's above all. And he's talking to you now? Yes. Your Honor, I don't have any further questions at this time. People, anything further? No, thank you, Your Honor. Any further evidence, Mr. Kurt? No, Your Honor. Okay. Your Honor, perhaps it would be best if we put Dr. Jones back on the stand so she can indicate whether her opinion has changed. Okay. Dr. Jones, if you'll please come back to the stand. You understand that you're still under oath? I do. Please be seated. Once again, just state your name. Jan Jones. Thank you, Your Honor. Dr. Jones, have you been in court um, the entire time that uh, the judge and Mr. Kurth have been talking with Mr. Barnes? I have. Were you able to determine whether what, well, given what you saw here, has your opinion as expressed in your evaluation of Mr. Barnes changed? Um, slightly. I still think that Mr. Barnes understands the role of the uh, participants in the court. I do think um, he understands the adversarial nature of the proceeding. I do think he's able to communicate with his attorney. Um, what I saw differently is that a little bit more religious thought. Um, I think possibly some of the stressors of the courtroom in sitting this long. Um, brings out that religiosity a little bit more. Has your opinion about his ability to proceed changed? Well, ultimately, that's, a, that's the um, decision of the court. I'm just telling you what skills I think he has or does not have. Has your opinion about his ability to work with his attorney changed as a result of what you've seen? I, think he, I still think he can work with his attorney. However, I think 
um, long periods of time would not be the optimal way for him to work with his attorney. I think his attorney would have to work with him in, in building the defense in short sessions because longer sessions become stressful for Mr. Barnes. Can you tell us what you mean by longer sessions and shorter sessions? I wouldn't know the exact amount of time, but I'm thinking if um, his attorney worked with him like in 30 minutes and then took breaks, I think an extended period of time is stressful to Mr. Barnes. Thank you. Nothing further. Good. Doctor, uh, you listened to Mr. Barnes uh, communicate with me and with the judge, correct? Yes, I did. Um, would it be fair to say that his defense, as he sees it today, to his crime was delus delusionally based? I'm not sure about that. I believe there may be some false thoughts related to how he saw the offense. He was indicating that uh, the woman with whom he, the alleged victim in this case, was communicating with him mm -hmm. uh, through different mediums. Did that appear grounded in reality? No. Okay. Um, he also, at different times, uh, was... Don't you believe at different times during this uh, colloquy he was responding to internal stimuli? It looked that way. I do think that as, 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 the, as the session, as the court hearing became lengthier, it was more stressful on him and his attention span and the possibility of, of other stimuli um, interfering with his attention was more obvious. So a long, the longer hearings go, the more difficult it is for him to stay focused and not uh, to stay focused externally. Yes, I agree with that. Um, if Mr. Barnes were to try to stay focused through a day or two of trial, pick a jury and assist me in cross-examining witnesses, based on today's limited hearing, do you think Mr. Barnes is able to do that? I think it would be difficult unless the court had some accommodations, we took lots of recesses and things like that. I think someone would have to tell the judge that he needed extra sessions um, or extra breaks. But yes, I think a um, traditional court hearing would be difficult in a traditional trial. And doctor, I appreciate your staying and listening to the colloquy and uh, having an open mind to take that into account and, and telling the court your opinion. Thank okay. you. People, any further? Nothing further, Your Honor. Thank you. You may step down and excuse. Any further on behalf of the defendant? No further testimony from the defense. People, any further? Other than statement? Nothing other than statement. Statement, please. Thank you, Your Honor. The standard of proof in this case is preponderance. The defendant is presumed competent unless and until the court finds a preponderance of the evidence shows otherwise. In other words, the status quo is competence. Your Honor has seen in her uh, testimony, and I don't need to go back over it, um, the bottom line from Dr. Jones on the stand seeing Mr. Barnes today is that with court accommodation, he would be able to work with counsel and I would submit that the court could choose to make those accommodations. It sounds like 30 minute recesses and therefore we submit that uh, Mr. Barnes is able to stand trial because the court certainly could accommodate um, what he would need to stand trial. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, I am asking the court to find my client at this point not able to proceed uh, with this case. I think it's Actually, the testimony is fairly clear at this point in talking to my client. Not only is his defense uh, based on irrational thoughts that this woman was communicating with him, uh, both verbally and non-verbally, by doing things such as uh, breaking a window and trimming trees, and that there was a man who lived above her that was also communicating to her about him, um, he thinks she's flirting with him, and then therefore he had to respond to that. I don't think. I know. I'm sorry, Mr. Oh, Barnes. I I'm not. I know. I don't think. Okay, I'm just saying. Yeah. Mr. Barnes truly believes this, and who am I to tell him he's wrong? I'm trying to explain to the court uh, what my client believes. Okay. You're welcome. I also want the court to recognize that while his defense <clears throat> to his the alleged crime is delusionally based. He also has a hard time maintaining focus during trial or during a hearing because he is responding to internal stimuli. 
uh, the court can take note of three or four different instances where uh, he had to ask uh, Your Honor or myself to repeat and explained that he was responding to the Lord, that he's been uh, specially chosen by the Lord to uh, bring certain messages. He does also believe that the Lord is in charge of the courtroom, not your honor, and he's in charge of all things. Again, Mr. Barnes, I'm not telling you I'm wrong, that you're wrong. I am just trying to tell the court your belief system, okay? This judge will have to make a decision. Based on those things, your honor, I do not believe we could proceed through the course of a trial. Uh, taking breaks after every 30 minutes doesn't alter the fact that this gentleman's belief structure is, in my opinion, delusional. I would ask that you find him not able to proceed at this point. Thank you, counsel. The issue before the court is whether the defendant is um, able to uh, proceed in looking at the uh, statute. First of all, the defendant does understand the charges that have been filed against him. The issue before the court is whether he's able to communicate appropriately with his counsel and assist in his uh, defense. The law does require the court to presume that a person is competent to proceed and covers both of those uh, elements. The court has had the opportunity now to observe the defendant on, on two uh, occasions and does have before an evaluation that has been somewhat modified today by the uh, uh, testimony given uh, by uh, Dr. Jones, the last time she was on the stand. Um, of what is concerned to the court here today is whether or not the defendant is so delusional today that it would impact his ability to, to consult with his counsel, to assist his counsel in um, a, um, a, if the trial were to, uh, to proceed. The concern of this court is that while on many levels it would appear that the defendant is able to proceed, this court finds that if I were to make that finding, that in essence I would be sealing the defendant's fate because based upon his actions and the statements and his behavior before a jury, that that would, in, in essence, not allow him to have a fair trial, and that his counsel could not be able to represent him as he is required to, to the degree of that he took an oath before this court to do so. So therefore, very, very reluctantly, and it's, it's, a, it's a close decision, this court is going to find, Mr. Barnes, that you're not able to proceed, that you, excuse me, that you are unable to proceed at this time, that that finding is based upon the um, lack of in, being in touch with reality and to a degree that you can assist your client, uh, excuse me, assist your counsel in your defense. And I'm aware of the seriousness of this decision. I know that you have a right to, to proceed in a timely uh, fashion, but your agitated behavior you're seeking to, to have the intervention, and there's, there's no doubt, as I indicate, that um, allowing you to proceed at this time would seal your fate without you really being able to have the representation of uh, your counsel. Um, the court could fashion a type of a trial, but I, based on what I've seen, it, it would disintegrate rapidly and we would just be putting off to another day the decision which needs to be done at this time. So the defendant pursuant to statute is remanded to custody of sheriff to be taken to the hospital for an evaluation and pursuant to the time frame returned here for further proceedings. People, anything further? No, Your Honor. Defense? Nothing further, Your Honor. Thank you. Will be there are a multitude of nuggets that we could take out of the hearing that you've just seen. Um, first and foremost, it is a best practice to advance a case as soon after a uh, competency evaluation is performed as possible. There are two reasons. One, as you can see from the hearing you've just seen, 
and opinion can change over time. That evaluation was 10 days old, and as you can see, the opinion that the doctor reached was different because of that delay. The other reason to advance is because otherwise the defendant is sitting in jail unnecessarily for an extra eight or nine days. Um, one of the other things that uh, hopefully came through is it is vital that the parties do not simply accept at face value the opinions rendered in the report. In this particular case, as I mentioned, they are 10 days old. The doctor opined that the defendant was competent. The judge ultimately ruled that the defendant was not competent. If there hadn't been a hearing on this issue, the defendant would have been found comp uh, competent, would have proceeded to trial, and it would have been um, a violation of the defendant's due process. Uh, another item of note, again, this hearing per, um, presumes there was an immunity agreement or an immunity statute. If the defendant had not been asked questions by his own attorney and by the judge, and the prosecutor um, could have cross-examined as well, if those questions had not been asked, it is quite clear that the defendant would have been found competent to stand trial, which is contrary to what ultimately came out as, um, as a result. So the immunity agreement helps reach the correct result, with the correct result being what the true state of the defendant's uh, mental capacity is. In this particular case, it was a very difficult call, and what it boiled down to really was what accommodations was the court willing to make? In this case, Dr. Jones testified that the defendant could go approximately 30 minutes uh, before needing to take a break and 30 minutes before needing to take a break. This particular judge determined that it would throw the trial off, the trial would disintegrate. That call could have gone either way. Uh, for example, if it's a, a one-day theft case, 30 minutes could push it into a two-day case. Is it worthwhile to push it into a two-day case um, from a judicial standpoint? Do you want to uh, delay the trial that long? On the other hand, if it's a two-week or a three-week murder trial, um, that's going to cause a longer delay. On the other hand, the stakes are much higher. As a judge, do you want to accommodate that? So this was a very close case. A reasonable judge could have gone either way, and it, it boiled down to the accommodation. Um, the other thing that this case pointed out is, uh, occasionally, an, uh, an evaluation opinion will come back competent, but the judge will find the defendant not competent. In this case, it's because there was a 10-day delay and the defendant's condition deteriorated. The difficulty comes, uh, comes into play when the court orders restoration treatment because a doctor has just opined that this person is capable of standing trial and yet the judge is saying, restore this person to competency. Um, it poses some difficulties, although typically the doctor who gives the opinion is a forensic uh, doctor, meaning one who renders opinions but doesn't treat. So the treating doctor is going to be different than the examining doctor, but it creates a whole host of issues on the treatment side. Um, the bottom line in this case, it is crucial to hold a hearing. It is a best practice to hold a hearing. And if you don't hold a hearing on competency when it's contested, it's a pretty good likelihood that you will not reach the correct result. Or if you do, it'll be by chance rather than by an appropriate judicial consideration of the facts.